The Assembly will now hear an address by His Excellency Mamadi Dumbuya, President of the National Committee for the Reconciliation and Development, President of the Republic of Guinea, Head of State. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Mamadi Dumbuya, President of the National Committee for Reconciliation and Development, President of the Republic of Guinea, Head of State, and I invite him to address the Assembly. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, heads of delegations, Mr. Secretary General. At the outset, Mr. President, I would like to extend the warm congratulations of the Guinean delegation on your brilliant election to the presidency of the 78th session of the United Nations General Assembly. Before this august assembly, I would also like to assure you of my country's support. I take this opportunity to also pay a well-deserved tribute to your predecessor, Mr. Shabakorsi of Hungary. to Mr. Secretary General Antonio Guterres. I extend my gratitude for the dedication with which he leads our organization. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, in coming to take part in the work of the 78th regular session of the General Assembly, I'm fulfilling a duty that of conveying the warm greetings of the sovereign people of Guinea. My country continues to place hope in the United Nations to find appropriate solutions to the issues our world continues to face. In this context, Mr. President, we believe that the fundamentals which underpinned the creation of our organization must adapt to the profound changes in our society. The theme of this session, peace, prosperity, progress, and sustainability is topical, evocative, and deserves particular attention on our part. There is a coup epidemic in Africa. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, the continent has been hit by an epidemic of military putsches, particularly in the French-speaking country south of the Sahara. Everyone condemns them, sanctions them, is disturbed by the sudden resurgence of this phenomenon that we had thought was a thing of the past, and rightly so. But what I wish to say is that the international community must have the honesty and the rectitude to not content itself simply with denouncing the consequences. Rather, it must look to and address the causes. Coups d'etat have multiplied in Africa in recent years because there are deep-rooted reasons for this. And to remedy the problem, ladies and gentlemen, we must look at these root causes. 
the putschist is not only the person who takes up arms to overthrow a regime. I want us all to be well aware of the fact that the real putschists, the most numerous, and those who avoid any condemnation, are also those who plot and scheme, who use trickery, who cheat to manipulate the text of the Constitution in order to stay in power eternally. It is those in white collar jobs who change the rules of the game as the game unfolds in order to keep the reins of power in their hands. These are the most numerous kinds of putches. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I am one of those who one day decided to shoulder our responsibility to prevent our country from slipping into complete chaos, into an insurrection. No political forces at the time had the courage nor the means to put an end to the duplicity that we were experiencing, as they were all completely neutralized back then. The institutional correction for which my brothers in arms and I took responsibility on September 5th, 2021, was only a consequence of that chaotic situation which had ended up tearing apart the social fabric of my country and undermining our coexistence. This is not an exhaustive list, but we believe that the transitions underway in Africa are due to several factors, including broken promises, the lethargy of the people, and leaders tampering with constitutions with the sole concern of remaining in power to the detriment of collective well-being. Today, the African people are more awake than ever and more than ever determined to take their destiny into their own hands. The unequal distribution of wealth creates endless inequalities, famine and abject poverty which make the lives, the daily lives of our populations increasingly difficult. These inequalities are part of the causes for the events that endanger our peaceful coexistence above all. When the wealth of a country is in the hands of an elite, while newborns die in hospitals due to a lack of incubators, it is not surprising that in such conditions we are seeing transitions in order to respond to the profound aspirations of the people. Africa, ladies and gentlemen, is suffering from a governance model that has been imposed on it. A model that is certainly good and effective for the West, which developed it over the course of its history, but which is difficult to incorporate and adapt to our realities, our customs, and our environment. Alas, I have to say that the graft did not take. I know that when I say this, many will immediately say to themselves, oh, another warmonger who wants to wring the neck of democracy, or another soldier who wants to impose his dictatorship. However, I want to say very clearly, without hypocrisy, without pretense, eye to eye, we're all aware that this democratic model that you have so insidiously 
skillfully imposed on us after the La Bolle summit in France. Something you've been imposing almost religiously. This model does not work. Various economic and social indices demonstrate this plain and clear. This is not a value judgment on democracy itself. Believe me, this is just taking stock of the situation. It's a balance sheet. Over several decades of chaotic experimentation with this model in our environment, we can make this observation. This was a period full of nothing but political games. And this, of course, has been to the detriment of what is essential, namely the economy. And the local processing of our natural resources. Allow me to take this truth exercise a little further. Through my short but very intense experience of managing a state, Guinea, I have come to better understand the extent to which this model has, above all, contributed to maintaining a system of exploitation and plunder of our resources by others. And a rampant corruption of our elites. National leaders who have often been granted democratic labels based on their acquiescence or their capacity for selling off the resources and the property of their people, or perhaps their ease in giving in to the pseudo recommendations and injunctions of the great powers. I must confess in this regard that everything that I am facing goes beyond all imagination. These are the same people who profess democracy, transparency, who denounce poor governance and corruption, who dictate the rules. It is they who, behind the scenes, very discreetly and underhandedly, are increasing pressure to make us cede our national wealth through unconscionable Leonine contracts. I understand certain leaders and some of my predecessors who, because they possess certain weaknesses, because they were under pressure, or because they had skeletons in their closets, or particularly because they had a political agenda, gave in to what was being asked of them. I understand them, even if I do not approve. In some cases, I was even reminded that if I had a political agenda, I would be less comfortable carrying out the reforms that my government and I are tackling. One thing is certain. We have but one concern, and that is the well-being of the people and living together. This is our priority. This is why the transition I lead has chosen to focus methodically on clear objectives in a precise order. The social, the economic, and the political. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I wear my uniform in service to my people, and I would be grateful if you would respect that oath, an oath to keep ourselves a respectable distance from divisions of all kinds that many attempt to fuel in our countries. The Sahel is undergoing one of the most serious 
crises in its very long history. But it has the resources that are required to face it. Its legendary sense of diplomacy must be unleashed so that we can speak to each other without interference. It is for this reason that ECOWAS, whose vocation was economic, must stop getting involved in politics and favor dialogue. The African people are tired, exhausted by the categorizations with which everyone wants to box us in. Africa's population is young. It did not experience the Cold War. It did not experience the ideological wars that have shaped the world over the last 70 years. That is why we Africans are insulted by the boxes, the categories which sometimes place us under the influence of the Americans, sometimes under that of the British, sometimes the French, or the Chinese, or the Russians, and even the Turks. We are neither pro nor anti-American. We are neither pro nor anti-Chinese, nor pro or anti-French, nor pro or anti-Russian, nor pro or anti-Turkish. We are simply pro-African, that is all. Placing us under the influence of this or that power is an insult. It is contempt and racism towards a continent of more than 1 billion, 300 million people. It is important that in this prestigious and influential assembly, we understand clearly and definitively that the era of the old Africa is over. With a population of more than 1 billion Africans, around 70% of whom are young people, young people who are completely free, open-minded, open to the world, and determined to take their destiny into their own hands. The time has come to realize that the structures, the rules from the post-war era established in the absence of our states, which did not yet exist at the time, are obsolete. This is the end of an unbalanced and unjust era where we had no say in the matter. It is time to take our rights into our account and to let us take our proper place, but also and above all, it is time to stop lecturing us and to stop treating us with condescension like children. Rest assured that we're old enough to know what is good for us. We are mature enough to define our priorities, to design our own models, which are in line with our identity, the daily reality of, of our countries and our populations, in line with what we are, quite simply. We would be very grateful to you if you trust us and let us run our business as you have allowed in certain regions of the world. 
as you have allowed in Asia, in the Near, and the Middle East to cite only a few. This infantilization that we have experienced has had the worst effects on African youth who are now emancipated. In this context, we are all challenged and called upon to carry a, out a better analysis of the situation with a view to initiating and pursuing new policies for the benefit of all. The international community must look to Africa with new eyes. It must now engage in genuine cooperation with Africa in a spirit of win-win partnership. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the National Committee for Reconciliation and Development, President of the Republic of Guinea and Head of State for the statement just made. I request protocol to escort His Excellency.